In the 15th chapter of Luke, there are three parables that illustrate just how much that man matters to God. We sometimes call this third parable the parable of the prodigal son. Commentator William Barclay says, For centuries the third parable has been called the parable of the prodigal son. It would be far better if it were to be called the parable of the loving father, for it is the father and not the son who is the hero of the story. And he's absolutely right. This parable is about the father's love for his children. Uh, in, his, in the play, The Merchant of Venice, William Shakespeare said, it is a wise father who knows his son. And I would tell you today that a father who takes time to know his children is a father who truly cares and understands how to love. And so in our parable today, we see a father who, um, who really knows his son, and uh, it's very evident from our message last week that this father uh, know, uh, loves his son. Um, we've already spoken of the story, but we're going to put emphasis on the father today. And to keep in mind, however, that the father knew his son so well that he kept, uh, he kept, he allowed his son to go do his own thing. But the whole time he's hoping that his son will return. And uh, he's praying that uh, one day that he will return. Remember Jesus is telling this parable because of the religious leaders. I didn't deal so much with this last week. But he has these religious leaders that were condemning him because he was hanging around sinners. And um, Jesus is bringing them to himself. And uh, that's the reason why that he was around sinners, but they didn't like it. Back there in verse 2 that it said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so they grumbled against Jesus, and Jesus res responded to their religious snobbery by telling these parables, these three parables in uh, Luke chapter 15. But in uh, the this old chapter, Jesus he tells these parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and uh, the one we're dealing with is the lost son. These parables make one point, and that is lost people matter to God. That's the point that's made. Lost people matter to God. And the parable of the prodigal enlightens us about God's boundless love through his son, our Savior. That's why we call it uh, the Savior today, the title of our message. And as we look at this third parable, I remind you once again that the main point of the parable is not about the prodigal son. Verse 11 says, a certain man had two sons. Now the father is the, the star of the story here. And the role of the prodigal son is only significant to the degree that he spotlights the love of the father. That's why he's significant, because it's spotlighting the love of the father. The younger boy is no more significant than the elder brother. The, the prodigal, and we'll deal with the elder brother next Sunday in our message, but the prodigal son, it speaks of, really, he's a representation of the tax collectors and the sinners. They were looked down upon because of their sinful life. But we find the elder brother uh, speaks and we'll talk about that next week. He's a representation of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so the father is the one that's doing the talking. And he declares that lost people matter to God. So let's look at three points about this. First of all, the father allows his son. You remember, you remember we talked last week how disrespectful and sinful the young man was as he gave his request. Um, to his father, verse 11 and 12, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to the father, father, give me the portion of goods that, that falls to me. It's all about, remember, give me. That's what he's about. And what a, an incredible request. And by dem demanding his cut of the father's loot while he was still alive, 
You remember I emphasized last week it was his way because no son in that period of time ever came to his father and asked of that. And so basically he's telling his father, I wish you were dead. In reality, you're dead to me. You know, there's no relationship between you and me. And so he didn't want a relationship with his father. He just wanted his father's stuff is what he wanted. And the only thing I would say to you that's more shocking than the son's request is the father's response. That's more, even more shocking than what the son requested. Verse 12, it says, and he divided to them his livelihood. Now, you would think that it would read, the father slapped the son upside the head and told him just how what kind of stupid request that was. You would think that it would read that way of what he had said. You know, that might be what, something like what we would say. Someone once said, life is hard, but it's even harder if you're stupid. You know, I thought that was a pretty, pretty good statement. But yet this loving father, he executed his will and he gave the younger brother one third of his estate. Now the stupidity of his son, it came out in verse 13 when it says, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living or wicked living uh, or reckless living. Where is this far country that we're talking about? You'll not find it uh, on the Bible atlas. In fact, I would tell you that it's not geography that's the issue here. The main point is that the far country was not where the father was. The father wasn't there, and so why should you be there? You should be where the father is, and the father's not there. Why did the father let his son take advantage of him like this? You say, there's no way in the world I'd let my children take advantage of me like that. I'm going to tell you, friend, love made him do it. That's the reason why he did that. The father loved him so much and wanted a relationship of love with him. That's what he wanted. And this is the heartbeat of God. God wants, hear me, Christian, God wants a personal relationship uh, with us uh, based on love. That's what God wants. And for that to happen... God must let us be free to reject him. And speaking about lost people, many lost people do reject him today. And uh, to win our hearts, God must subject himself to a broken heart. And believe me, God's heart is broken when he looks down and see how many people today, they're living wickedly in a far country and they reject God the Father. They reject the, the God of creation the one who created this world, the one who loved them so much that he sent his own son to die for them on the cross of Calvary. They have rejected that. And I would say to have a relationship with us based on love, our God has to put himself in a position where, where we can take advantage of him. And I'll speak about that in just a few moments, but some people serve God because of rules. Did you know that? Some people do that. They view God as an angry tyrant and waiting to body slam every sinner into hell. And they think that God is watching and waiting for them to, to commit the, the smallest infraction of his laws so God can rain down his wrath on them. You speak to some people and that's the way they view God, as a God of total wrath. That's the only way they see him. And that's not God. And that's not what God is all about. Yes, God is a God of wrath, but he's also a God of love. Understand that. Some people serve God because of rewards. These kinds of people view God as Santa Claus. That's the way they see him. They picture God in a throne room somewhere filled with presents of, uh, for those who are her nice people. God's going to have presents for them. And they try to please God so they don't get coal in their stockings. And so they're, they're wanting to do all these nice things. Yes, they know that salvation is not theirs by right. They know that Christ secured their salvation. However, they think that if they will follow the rules, they'll be able to earn their reward, and somehow they think that they must earn their place in the covenant blessing. 
Somehow or another, they come to that point. But that's not God, and hear me today, that's not what God is about. I'm telling you today, my friend, God wants us to serve him because he wants a relationship with us. That's the reason why. God wants that relationship. Salvation is not earned. It's a gift of grace. And it comes to us through the working of the Holy Spirit. However, for God to have his heart's desire, he must let himself be taken advantage of. And we take advantage of him. We have taken advantage of him. That's why the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've taken advantage of God. We've taken care, advantage of the goodness of God um, because of sin in this world. He must allow himself to be offended, used, and rejected for a season. And the only way God can get us to love him is by giving us uh, giving us the right not to love him. And that's where we are today. We have that opportunity to choose. Lost friend, you're here today. You can choose either receive or reject God. He's allowed you that opportunity. I love this story that I've told on numerous occasions that I think that illustrates this because God doesn't want to, you know, bring a hammer down to us to make us love him. What kind of love is that? A king saw a peasant girl and immediately fell in love, but because of his high position in her low estate, he had to proceed strategically. You see, he could give a royal mandate and say, I love you and I want to marry you and I'm I'm going to mandate because of my position for you to love me and to marry me. But you and I know that you can't demand true love. We know that. We understand that. And, uh, you know, he could shower gifts upon her and try to sweep her off of her feet that way. But we all know that you don't buy true love. You don't do that. And so he dressed himself as a, a peasant and he went into the field and there he worked beside her. And it wasn't long before a relationship was formed And it got to the point to where she loved him so much that it didn't matter to her whether he was a king or a commoner. It didn't make any difference. Only thing that mattered was there was love there. And then it was safe for him to to reveal his identity. That's the kind of love our father has. He wants us to love him. But I want you to see, second of all, the father awaits his son. I don't know of any parent who would have honored the boy's selfish request that he had. If a parent would do it, I can see it only happening with anger and disgust and really probably finality. And I say that from the standpoint that a parent today perhaps would say, okay, look, I'm going to give you the money, but while I'm writing the check, I want you to pack up your bags and by the way, don't be coming back. You know, I'm tired of all this, and so you hit the road and, uh, you know, and don't come back. But that's not what the father does here. The father waited for his son to come home. You'll find always there looking for the son to come home. He left the, the, the door open for his son. He left the room prepared for his son. He kept the, I can just imagine my mind's eye, the place where the son sat, Um, He sat down to eat his food that it was prepared there waiting for him to come home. He even started fattening the calf for the homecoming celebration. That calf was ready. He'd been waiting. He'd been feeding this calf to to where he'd be ready for the celebration. And so the father eagerly awaited the son's return. And the good news today, my friend, is that you may have wasted God's fortune You may have wasted the good years of your life serving yourself in the sin of this world, but you have not exhausted God's love. You've not exhausted it. No matter what you have done, God still loves you. No matter what you have done, God still cares about you. No matter what you have done, God still wants you. No matter what you have done, God still has a place for you in his family. That's our God. Isn't he a wonderful God? 
God's waiting for you to come back home today. I read of a man who had committed a crime. You've heard the story, very famous story, for when he, he committed a crime he was deeply ashamed of, and when he had served prison sentence time, he's about to be released, and he's wondering whether his family would reject him because of the scandal and the shame that he had caused uh, brought upon his family. And so he wrote his parents a, a letter saying that he would be coming by in the bus but that he didn't want to embarrass them uh, with his presence if they didn't want him back. And so he told them, he asked them to tie a yellow ribbon around the oak tree there at the end of the street where the bus would go by and see whether uh, they wanted him to return home or not. And he went on to tell them the letter, if there's no ribbon on the tree, then the bus will pass on by and I won't get off the, I won't get off the bus. So he's really anxious on his journey, thinking about this as he's on his way home. As he got nearer and nearer to the street, he's thinking, oh, I just can't look. I don't know what's going to happen. He asked the bus driver, if you would, as we come around the corner up here, would you look for me? He told him the story. And he needn't have worry because by the time he got there, the tree was covered with yellow ribbons. You remember the story? The whole community joined with the parents in welcoming the young man back home. There's a famous American song written about it. I think that it's about this story, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. You've heard it. All of you have. But the man was forgiven and he was welcomed back into his family. And that's what God does to anyone who comes to him and asks for forgiveness. That's what God does for all. He doesn't show us a yellow ribbon, my friend, but he shows us the cross of Calvary. He shows us his nail-pierced hands as a sign of forgiveness and acceptance. That's what he does. You might wonder why the dad did not chase after the son. I've had that question asked to me, and that comes up. Why didn't he chase after him? He could have sent the elder brother after him in many cases, that would be true that the elder brother would go and look for the son. But I'll tell you the reason why is because the young man was a free moral agent. You've heard that term before. He chose to leave and he must choose to come home. And the dad knows that. The dad understands the boy must choose to come home. You can drag him back home, but he's going to do somewhat of the same thing once again. But likewise, God will not go to the far country. Hear me, my friend. He's not going to go to the far country and drag you out of that bar or pull you away from uh, your uh, wicked, sinful friends that you're around. Uh, he's not going to force you to come back home and lock you in a room. Our God's not going to do that, my friend. You must make the decision that you're going to come to God. You're going to come home. You're the one that has to make that decision. There was a man that was given a check for a sizable amount by a, a multi-millionaire, and he went to the bank to cash it, and, um, but there the teller would not cash the check. And uh, the man said, uh, do you not know this person that wrote this church, this check? And she said, uh, yes, I know of the man. And he said, do you not know uh, of just the worth of this man? And she said, uh, yes, I know of the worth. Then, then he demanded why she wouldn't, sign, wouldn't cash the check. And she said, you haven't endorsed it. And once you endorse it, I'll cash the check. Friend, hear me today. The blood of Jesus is sufficient to pay for your sins. But you have to endorse it by faith. That's what you have to do. You must run to the cross of Jesus Christ acknowledging what he did for you, and you must come home. The young man had wasted his inheritance, and uh, on this ultimate uh, spring break in the city, when the time came to pay the bill, the small, the small fortune was depleted. It's all gone. He hit rock bottom. Verse 17 
But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I have perished with hunger? I rise and go to my father and will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, this is a turning point in the story. The young man came to his senses, and he comes home, which brings us to our our final point today. The father accepts the son. Notice two aspects of this father's restoration. First of all, the father generously restored the son. Verse 18 and 19, the son's rehearsing of what he's going to say. Have you ever done that going down the road? Maybe in some situation to where you've messed up and you're thinking, man, how do I apologize or what am I going to say? And you're, you're, you're thinking of these things I need to say. No, I need to say this. You're, you're rehearsing all this. You can imagine how he had plenty of time to think about coming from a far country of uh, what, what he was going to say to the father. He's thinking, maybe I can negotiate my way back into the house by asking a, a, a job for a job just as one of the household servants. And um, he's coming back with a repentant heart. I, I want you to understand, he's not. you see him leaving as a haughty young man, but he, he doesn't come back as a, with a haughty heart, but with a humble heart. He comes back humble before the Lord. And uh, James tells us, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And so we must humble ourselves. The only way that salvation can come is by humbling ourselves, realizing of, of our sin. But little did the son know that the father had already been waiting. Uh, he had been watching for him to come home. Every day he's out there looking, when's the son going to come home? I find it rather interesting that the dad didn't hear that the son had come home. He saw him from afar that he was coming. In other words, he's been looking every day for that son to come home. Verse 20, I would tell you, is one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. Now, how many times do you hear a pastor say that? You know, I know you hear a lot, but you know what? The Bible is full of powerful verses, is it not? And I say, when I read that, this verse, I said, wow, this has got to be one of the best verses in the Bible right here. And it says, and he arose and came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I love that verse. That speaks of what God did for us. You know, we finally came to the place we realized that we were just sinners. And we came to Jesus and did he say, you sorry bum that you are. No, our God said, I'm glad you came home. I love you. That's what God the Father says. I believe that the scribes and the Pharisees, you think about this story, talking about the, uh, the scribes and Pharisees, the chapter begins that way and it's speaking about them. Uh, They're standing there listening to Jesus tell this story. And I believe that they would expect it in the story for the father to maintain his honor by initially refusing to see him. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, and this is in a a light way, a light sentence against him to do this. They probably expected the story to tell that the father would make make him sit out aside of the village there at the gate of the family home for days so people can come by and see his shame and his disgrace. Uh, People would view that. Or uh, maybe the father make him do various hard tasks in order to perform restitution for his reckless and wicked way of living. You'd think that, I'm sure the Pharisees are thinking a lot about this, However, the Bible tells us that the father saw the returning son and he's moved with compassion. Compassion is his heart. You find no anger or disgust with him and when his son comes. And friend, that's our God. That's the way our God is. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. But our God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants all of us to come home. 
God wants everyone to come and know the truth and know the Father and uh, know the Son. Moved with compassion, the Father ran to meet the prodigal. And I would tell you that in the ancient Near East that men of age and wealth and status did not run. It was very undignified. And I'm, I like that. That's good. Keep me from having to run, okay? Uh, I'm not going to run. It's undignified, okay? But that's the way it was during that period of time. Older men did not run. It was very undignified for them to do that. But the father here says, but the, the story here, the father ran to meet the son. And one obvious reason was his love for him and his desire to show him that love that he ran to meet him. I like what Warren Wearsby, he, a Bible commentator, Bible teacher, had the joy of hearing Warren Wearsby on many occasions before he went to be with the Lord. But I find that he had something very interesting here. He said, this wayward son was brought, uh, had brought disgrace to the family and village. And according to Deuteronomy 21, I referred to that last week. According to Deuteronomy 21, he should have been stoned to death. If the neighbors had started to stone him, they would have hit the father who was embracing him. What a picture of what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. That's what Jesus did. He put his arms around us and he protected us. Protected us from the world. Protected us from destruction. What a wonderful statement I think uh, Wearsby gave here. So in our story, the father overtook the son. He embraced him. And he showers him with kisses. And once they caught their composure, the boy said, well, now it's time for me to give my prepared speech. You know what I'm thinking about. And, uh, but the father cut him off and he said, I don't want to hear it. None of that matters now. You're home. You've come home. None of that matters. And my friend, that is the restoring grace of God. You say, I've been such a horrible sinner. Well, come to Jesus today, and if you will repent of your sins and call upon him, none of that matters. Come to him today. God has grace. He will give you his grace. No one has gone so far that they cannot come home, and the finished work of Christ has paid the price for you to be restored to God. What you have done does not matter. You just need to come home and be restored by Almighty God. Regeneration. Forgiveness of sins needs to take place. Spurgeon told the story, which I found rather interesting, is he looked out into his garden and there was a dog out there playing among the flowers and kind of stirring around out there. He didn't like it. He wanted to take care of his flowers. And he knew that the dog was not pulling weeds uh, because that's what needed to be done. But since it wasn't his dog, he threw a, a, stick, a stick out there and he hollered at the dog in order to get the dog to go away. Well, the dog very quickly made Spurgeon ashamed for treating the dog so harshly for throwing a stick out there. And it fetch, fetched the stick and wagging his tail, he came back and dropped the stick at Spurgeon's feet. And this is what Spurgeon said. Do you think I could strike him or drive him away after that? No, I patted him on the head, called him good names, and the dog had conquered the man. <laughs> but, you know, then he went on to, uh, Spurgeon went on to apply it, and this is what Spurgeon said. And if you, poor sinner, dog as you are, can have confidence enough in God to come to him just as you are, it is not in his heart to spurn you. It's not in God's heart to turn us away. No matter what you've done, he won't turn us away. Because he loves us. Then we find the father gladly restored the son. Verse 22. But the father said to the servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Ernest Hemingway wrote a story about a father and his teenage son. And in the story, the relationship had become somewhat strained, and the teenage son ran away from home. 
His father began on a a journey in a search to find this rebellious son. He was having a hard time finding the boy, and finally, um, he's in Madrid, Spain, had had, uh, had spent all of his resources to try to find where this boy was and bring him home. But there he's in Madrid, Spain, and in a last desperate attempt in order to bring the boy home, he decided to take an ad out in the local newspaper. And there in the paper he, he put in there, and it read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. Well, the next day, knowing that Paco is a very common name there in Spain, the next day in front of the newspaper office, 800 Pacos showed up. They're all seeking forgiveness. They're all seeking the love of the Father. That's what they want. They want forgiveness. They want love of the Father. The prodigal wanted forgiveness just like those boys named Paco. And forgiveness is what the Father gives. That's the exciting thing about the story. Along with forgiveness came celebration. The boy had come home, the son's home. He ordered the servants to bring the best robe and put it on the son. You see, the best robe was reserved for the man of the house, but the father said, go and get my robe and put it on the son. And uh, friend, that's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. He clothed us in his righteousness. That's what he did. The Bible says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He put his righteous robe on us is what he did. He ordered them to put a signet ring on his son's finger to symbolize Uh, authority in the house. He ordered them to put sandals on his feet and finally he ordered them to kill the fatted calf that the, the, the dad had been preparing. Kill the fatted calf because now's the time for the party. Now's the time for the celebration. And they celebrated because the son was alive again. He's come home. For them to party, understand the fatted calf had to be killed in order for them to have a party. The fatted calf, my friend, in the story is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the picture. He's the Savior. My friend, I'm going to tell you, it's because Jesus died, we have a reason to rejoice today. Because Jesus died, we have a reason to celebrate because of what he has done for us. And when God forgives... He removes the sin and he restores the soul is what takes place. I'm so glad I know Jesus today. How about it, friend? Do you know him? That's that old song that we have sung through the years. But think about it. Sometimes we move right through these old hymns or we move through some of our newer praise and worship songs and don't listen to the words of them. This old hymn said, I was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore, very deeply, very deeply stained in sin, seeking to rise no more. I'm going down, never to come up again. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. And from the waters he lifted me. Now safe or now saved am I. I'm safe. Because of Jesus Christ. Stand together and sing it with me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Nothing but the Father's love. That's it. The Father loved the lost son and he came home. And when he came, time to come home, my friend, he didn't let any grass grow under his feet. I mean, he's on his way home. 
I think about some today that will say, well, I'll wait till tomorrow or I'll wait till next week or maybe when I get a little bit older. My friend, the hardest step is the first step. And I hope that you'll take that step today. God the Father loves you today. He wants you to come home. Take that step towards God the Father today. The Son, the Savior, has already paid your sin debt. All you have to do is come home.